Hello, I'm Ashley Knox, Digital Projects Librarian for the University of South Carolina and the SIMS Initiatives. We're a digital humanities project of the University Libraries, which is funded in part with a generous grant from the Watson Fo Brown Foundation. In celebration of Halloween and to promote our site, we're reading one of SIMS ghost stories throughout the month of October. The story is called Grayling or Murder Will Out, and it is a part of the author's short story collection, The Wigwam and the Cabin. At the point where we last left our story, McNabb was under arrest, but confirmation of Major Spencer's murder was still needed to prosecute him. The defense attorney ridiculed James Grayling's ghost story as the accuser's only proof. Here now is part 17 of William Gilmore Sims Grayling, or Murder Will Out. In those days, however, the ancient superstition was not so feeble as she has subsequently become. The venerable judge was one of those good men who had a decent respect for the faith and opinions of his ancestors. And though he certainly would not have consented to the hanging of MacLeod, under the sort of testimony which had been adduced, he yet saw enough in all the circumstances to justify his present detention. In the meantime, efforts were to be made to ascertain the whereabouts of Major Spencer, though were he even missing, so the counsel for MacLeod contended, his death could be by no means assumed in consequence. To this the judge shook his head doubtfully. For God, said he, I would not have you to be too sure of that. He was an Irishman, and proceeded after the fashion of his country. The reader will therefore bear with his bull. A man may properly be hung for murdering another, though the, murderer, the murdered may be not dead. I, before God, even though he be actually unhurt and uninjured, while the murderer is swinging by the neck for the bloody deed. The judge, who it must be understood, was a real existence and who had no small reputation in his day in the South, proceeded to establish the correctness of his opinions by authorities and argument, with all of which, doubtlessly, the bar were exceedingly delighted, but to provide them in this place would be only to interfere with our own progress. James Grayling, however, was not satisfied to wait the slow processes which were suggested for coming at the truth. Even the wisdom of the judge was lost upon him, possibly for the simple reason that he did not comprehend it. But the ridicule of the culprit's lawyer stung him to the quick, and he muttered to himself, more than once, a determination to lick the life out of that impudent chap's leather. But this was not his only resolve. There was one which he proceeded to put into instant execution, and that was to seek the body of his murdered friend in the spot where he fancied it might be found. Namely, the dark and dismal bay where the specter had made its appearance to his eyes. The suggestion was approved, though he did not need this to prompt his resolution, by his mother and uncle Sparkman. The latter determined to be his companion, and he was farther accompanied by the sheriff's officer who had arrested the suspected felon. Before daylight, on the morning after the examination, before the judge had taken place, and when McLeod had been remanded to prison, James Grayling started on his journey. His fiery zeal received additional force at every added moment of delay and his eager spurring brought him at an early hour afternoon to be to the neighborhood of the spot where which his search was to be made. When his companions and himself drew nigh, they were all at a loss in which direction first to proceed. The bay was one of those massed forests whose wall of thorns, vines, and close tenacious shrubs seemed to defy invasion. To the eye of the townsman, it was so forbidding that he pronounced it absolutely impenetrable. But James was not to be baffled. He led them round it, taking the very course which he had pursued the night when the revelation was made. He showed them the very tree whose, at whose foot he had sunk when the supernatural torpor, as he himself esteemed it, began to fall upon him. He then pointed out the spot, some twenty steps distant, at which the specter made his appearance. To this spot they then proceeded in a body and essayed an entrance, but were so discouraged by the difficulties at the outset that all, James not excepted, concluded that neither the murderer nor his victim could possibly have found entrance there. This has been part 17 of William Gilmore Sims' Grayling, or Murder Will Out. I hope you will tune in next time for another section of this special Halloween tale. If you would like to read the full text of this story, or any of the many other works we have available, simply visit the Sims Initiative's website at sims.library.sc.edu. Until then, happy Halloween!